Marine should lose most of her remaining constitutional powers, according to a report from an influential think tank. The report, which is still being finalized, is being prepared by the research group Demos, which has close links with the Labour leadership. The monarchy's gone through many changes in recent years, and there have been calls for an end to the Queen's role in ceremonial occasions like the state opening of Parliament. Now, the left-leaning think tank Demos is proposing constitutional changes which would confine the royals to a purely symbolic role. The document is expected to suggest that bills should no longer need royal assent to become law, MPs shouldn't have to swear allegiance to the Queen, and she should no longer have the power to order an election after a hung parliament. What we really want to do is take a step back and look at what kind of role the monarchy should be playing as we approach the next century. Which bits are right and have public support, and which bits are looking a bit anachronistic now and are getting between the monarchy and the public. One biographer of the Queen argues that the proposals are hardly alarming, as the monarchy's political function has already eroded almost to non-existence. The Queen's remaining power has, has reduced to really the appointment of a few, few honours for the very few. Um, so I don't think that the, the, the suggestions of Demos um, are, are in any sense revolutionary. And also, I have to say, I don't think they're at all necessary. The Demos proposals about the monarchy when they're published in September will be studied with interest as there are close ties between the group and Downing Street. Its head, Jeff Mulgan, works at the Number 10 Policy Unit. But there's certainly no suggestion that what Demos calls for will be enshrined in future Labour government policy. Carolyn Quinn, BBC News. Now with news of a finely poised fourth test match and the rest of today's sport, here's Helen Rollison. Thank you, Peter. South Africa still has the upper hand after the third day of the fourth test at Trent Bridge. A half century from Mark Rampakash guided England towards a first innings total of 336. At the close, the Tories had reached 92 for three in their second innings, a lead of 130 runs. One bad day will be enough to end England's chances of winning this series. But today, at least, the home side hinted that they could yet turn around this disappointing summer. Mark Rampakash held the England innings together. The problem was his partner's lack of staying power. Hick notched up another test failure, out for six. The debutant, Andrew Flintoff, was the only member of the lower order to reach double figures, caught behind for 17. And for the time that Rampakash celebrated a half century, the England innings was nearly over. But the Middlesex captain's unbeaten 67, his highest test score at home, has helped claw England back to within 38 runs of their opponents. The England bowlers seem to fancy their chances of victory, and for an hour that looked a real possibility. Liebenberg's clear cut dismissal was followed by a far more controversial one. Jack Hannis wasn't as convinced as some of the England players that he'd touched the ball, but he had to go. And worse was to follow for the South Africans. Kirsten's departure left them on 21 for three. On this occasion, those spending the afternoon watching paint dry had definitely been missing out. The picture of the match, though, had changed considerably by the close. Darrell Cullinan, along with his captain, Andy Cronier, took the score onto 92 for three. England's bowlers will need to strike early tomorrow. James Pearce, BBC News. Diane Madal has won her first major title since returning to competition after being cleared of drugs charges two years ago. She won the 800 metres of the three A's championships in Birmingham. Britain's top 400 metres runners are also safely through to set up an enticing final tomorrow. Diane Madal's primary aim as she set off in the 800 metres of the three A's championship in Birmingham was to get back on course in her bid to win gold in the Commonwealth Games later this year in Malaysia. Those games will hold a special significance for her, as it will be a chance to wipe out memories from four years ago when she was sent home for failing a drug test earlier that season in Portugal. She was later reinstated on appeal in 1996. Her time wasn't fast enough for her to gain automatic entry to the European Championships later this season, but does mean she qualifies for England's Commonwealth Games 800 metres team. The men's 100 metres has a more unfamiliar lineup this season, no longer featuring Linford Christie. Ian Mackey was also absent due to injury. But in a close finish, Darren Campbell produced the fastest time by Britain this year of 10.22. It'll be the 400 metres, though, in which future medal prospects are brightest. Mark Richardson, Ewan Thomas, and Solomon Moriso ease into tomorrow's final, where they'll face Roger Black with the British record under threat. Bernie Rose, BBC News. 
There was a surprise in qualifying today for tomorrow's Austrian Grand Prix. Giancarlo Fisichello is on pole position for the first time in his career. But Britain's David Coulthard is back in 14th place after a rain-affected session. Fisichella, driving a Benetton, set the fastest time in the final seconds of qualifying. Francis jean is second on the grid in a Sauber. The championship leader, Mika Hakkinen, is third, with Michael Schumacher fourth. Swain, written by Frankie de Tori, won the King George VI and Queen Elizabeth Diamond Stake as Ascot for the second year running. It's only the second time a horse has won the race in successive years. The six-year-old showed all his class, beating the favourite and derby winner, High Rise. Jim McGrath describes the closing stages. The president of the French Cycling Federation has said that there's no question of scrapping the Tour de France despite the drug scandals dominating this year's event. The 13th stage of the race was won by Daniel Nardello of Italy in a thrilling finish on the line at the end of the 196-kilometre stage from Fontignon to Carpentras. In a six-man sprint, Nardello just got the edge. Last year's winner, Jan Ulrich of Germany, retained the yellow jersey, coming in 2 minutes and 51 seconds behind the leading group. The British Olympic swimmer Mike Fibbins has been banned for a year after testing positive in a drugs test. The former 50 and 100 metre British record holder was found to have taken a performance enhancing drug at a World Cup meeting in Sheffield earlier this year. Funny golf from Britain's Laura Davis is leading the Chrysler Open in Gothenburg by two shots after the third round. Lee Westwood, though, is two shots off the lead at the Dutch Open behind Australia's Stephen Leaney. Peter. More than 400 aircraft took part in an 80th birthday tribute to the RAF today at Fairford in Gloucestershire. Tens of thousands of people watched as planes old and new took to the skies in what's become the world's biggest air tattoo. 200,000 spectators are expected at the world's biggest air show this weekend. They'll be joining in the celebrations to mark the RAF's 80th birthday. Aircraft and crews from nearly every serving squadron are in Gloucestershire. The public is getting a chance to find out more about the Royal Air Force at first hand. I have to tell you that a gathering of 450 aeroplanes for such a great cause as the RAF charities, it's great to be down here. People pay for our aircraft. We never forget the fact that the taxpayers fund every single thing we do and that we work for the country. Special displays from new and old fighter planes have been put on to enthrall the crowds. The RAF was formed on April the 1st, 1918, and ever since it's played a key role in the defence of British interests. One of the most dramatic events in its history was the Berlin Airlift, when the RAF helped to deliver 2 million tonnes of supplies despite a Russian blockade. That episode was reenacted for spectators today. But they also got a chance to investigate present-day high-tech aircraft, emphasising how far the Royal Air Force has come in 80 years. Ishbel Matheson, BBC News. And the main news tonight, a man has been charged with the murder of the two policemen shot dead inside Washington's Capitol building, an act President Clinton called a moment of savagery at the front door of American civilization. That's all from the BBC Newsroom tonight. From Helen and me. Good evening to I know many of you like to see Atlantic, pic Atlantic satellite pictures, so here they are. You can see lots of cloud coming in from the Atlantic, so it is going to stay, I'm afraid, very unsettled for the spells of rain. This one here actually could bring us some quite wet weather come Tuesday. But the current rain is coming from this weather system as it pushes its way steadily eastwards, pushing our area of high pressure away into Europe. And you can see where the rain is now. It's been moving across Ireland into western parts of Scotland. A few light outbreaks further east, and indeed overnight, we could see a few more of those, but overnight, most of the rain will stay across western parts of Scotland and indeed through Ireland, with the southeast staying largely dry. Now, it certainly was a chilly night for July last night. Not as cold tonight, though temperatures about 9 or 10 at lowest. So on to tomorrow, and I think we're going to find some dry and brightish weather in the southeast. A lot of thin high clouds, so the sun, if it does come through, not particularly strong. Rain from the word go in western areas, nudging its way eastwards as the day goes on, and we could see a few spots coming through into East Anglia in the southeast, but many areas here are staying dry, and perhaps turning drier and brighter across Northern Ireland by the end of the day. 
Temperatures highest in the southeast around about 23 degrees. And as I said, during the first part of next week, more wet and windy weather coming in from the west. Good night. Imagine millions of people frozen rigid. I saw a lot of these sort of strange, motionless patients. A plague which left those it touched as living statues. It was a fantastic mystery. This disease is not just history. I've now seen four patients with presumed encephalitis lethargica. A new series of QED begins with an investigation into sleepy sickness. Wednesday at 9.30 on BBC One. The Stereophonics. When I see Kelly, I think, that's my kid, you know, that's my little boy. Like. I could find the man, my dad. Sorry, come off from work, and if you're shouting at Rich, I turn that noise down. I just said it better, and I can't see it often, no, you know. I used to think, was it worthwhile? But they thought it was worthwhile. And I thought, oh, Richard Branson, and they must be good. They brought you the Stereophonics, a family affair. Thursday night, 8 o'clock, BBC Two, Wales. On the wrong side of the L.A. law, a family with all the trappings have something to hide. Corbin Burnson hopes to uncover a dark and deadly secret. Dead on the money is at 12.20. First on BBC One Wales, Clint Eastwood directs and stars in tonight's tough western. He's the silent driver with a ruthless streak. High Plains Drifter.